You know, one of the amazing things about our God is that in every single season of our lives, he holds on to us and he comforts us and gives us strength. May you experience that comfort and strength today. Amen? Amen. 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 Please be seated. Well, you know, became, uh, uh, before I became to uh, serve here at Our Savior, I used to work on college campuses, and the last campus that I worked at was the University of Tampa. And uh, one day, about a year ago, on a Saturday, Elena and I said, hey, wouldn't it be great to take our two young daughters to see this place that I used to work at? I mean, not only does it have incredible green spaces and beautiful parks, if you've ever been there, you know what I'm talking about, but also it has some incredible Buildings. In fact, that the main building, Plant Hall, as you see on the screen, that used to be a hotel a hundred years ago that people would come to from all around the world. For example, the, the, the Queen of England, she stayed there. The Prince of Wales stayed there. Teddy Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, they stayed there. Even Babe Ruth, the most prolific baseball player of all time, he signed his first baseball contract in the dining room of, of Plant Hall. And so over the years, it's, it's partly become a museum. You, you may have been to the museum before. It's also become partly classroom space for students at the University of Tampa. And so we said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if our two young daughters, especially Abigail, who was four years old at the time, to see this incredible building? And so about a year ago, on a Saturday about midday, we drove over to Plant Hall. We parked behind Plant Hall. And as we did, Abigail looked out the window and she said, uh, Mommy, Daddy, where are we? And I said, "Uh, we're at the University of Tampa. Daddy used to work here. And she looked out the window again. She said, "Uh, Mommy, Daddy, you didn't tell me that we were going to see a castle. Now, friends, at this point, we had to make a parenting decision, okay? Do we let this go or or see where it goes and and, and try and go with it? We decided, you know, let's just see where this goes. We said, oh, okay, a a, a castle? Well, Abigail, do you want to go see the castle? And she said, yes, yes, go, let's go. I I, want to see the princess, and Elaine and I looked at each other in the front seat. We're like, oh, the, the, the princess. <laughs> oh, um, and then we quickly came up with something. We're like, well, you know, sometimes uh, they like to travel on the weekends. Royals are always traveling. So if there is a princess here, it's likely that the princess might not be here. You know what Abigail said? She said, oh, uh, oh no, she's here. I, I just know it. <laughs> we're like, all right, well, here we go. So we went into the, the back of Plant Hall. We went up the stairs. If you've ever been inside has the cushiest carpet in the world. And then we're looking around at all these statues and paintings and different things like that. But Abigail, she wasn't paying attention to any of that because she was looking for the princess. And so we followed her down the long hallway. We went upstairs the second floor looking in the classrooms. Nope, no princess here, no princess here. Finally, we had looked through the entire building and we made our way down to the lobby and we were getting ready to tell Abigail, Abigail, I'm sorry, I think the princess is traveling this weekend. When all of a sudden she looked out the front doors of Plant Hall and said, Mommy, Daddy, the princess. And we're like, wait, what? And she's like, come on, come on, come on. And so she led us out the front doors. And right there on the front steps of Plant Hall was a bride and a groom (laughs) and the entire wedding party. And they had just gotten married. And they just happened to be at that moment taking pictures right on the front steps of Plant Hall. And Abigail just looked at us like, I told you she would be here. (laughs) And so we kind of, you know, motioned off to the side. We're like, let's get over here. Let's, you know, we can watch them, but let's not get in their way. And so we watched them for about a minute. And Abigail's just staring at the bride. Like, she's not caring about anything else. She's staring at the bride. And all of a sudden, two of the bridesmaids, they turn around and they see us off to the side. And they quickly put two and two together. They see what Abigail's doing. And they say, hey, do you want to meet the princess? (laughs) And Abigail was like, "Uh uh-huh. And so they, 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 they got the attention of the bride. The bride turned around and said, hey, do you want to come over here? And Abigail sort of looked at us like, is that okay? And we're like, yeah, go ahead. You can go on over there. And so she went over there, and, and, and she knelt down. The bride knelt down, and she said, hey, what's your name? And Abigail said, my, my name's Abigail. And she said, Abigail, you have the most beautiful eyes. You know what? I know that one day you're going to be a princess too. Now, friends, we were kind of off to the side with Haley. We couldn't really hear everything that they were saying, but at some point, Abigail reached into her pocket, and she picked out this little flower that she had picked outside a plant hall earlier, and she gave it to the bride. And the bride said, oh, Abigail, this is so beautiful. You know what I'm going to do with it? I'm going to stick it in my bouquet, 
and I'm going to keep that bouquet forever. And whenever I look at that bouquet and I see your flower, I'm going to think of you. And then the bride, she took the flower, she put it in the bouquet, then she took a flower off of her bouquet, and she gave it to Abigail. She said, Abigail, I am so happy that I got to meet you today. I will always remember our time together. And then the bride gave her the biggest hug. They said their goodbyes, and Abigail just walked back to us like this. (laughs) Now, friends, you know what was so amazing about that interaction? Was that the bride... She didn't have to do any of that. I mean, think about it. This was her wedding day. This was the day to celebrate her. And yet in the midst of everything that was going on, she stopped the photographer. She stopped the wedding party. She she had all these family and friends who were waiting for her at the reception. And yet she took five minutes to meet with my daughter and make her feel like she was the most important person in the world at that moment. You know, for days and weeks afterwards, whenever we get together with family and friends, the very first thing that she would say, you know what she'd say? She'd say, guess what? I went to a castle and I met a princess on the day that she got married. And friends, every time she told that, you could just sense how amazed she was that a princess took the time to speak with her. Now, friends, let me ask you this morning, have you ever had an an interaction like that before? In other words, have you ever found yourself in the presence of a prominent and important person and they stopped what they were doing just to to interact with you? Like maybe one time you went to a concert, you got to go backstage and the band members, they took the time to meet with you and take a picture with you? Or maybe one time you were at an airport and one of your favorite actors was there, like you saw them off to the side and Instead of blowing you off, the actor just took the time to chat with you. Or maybe one time you were at a baseball game, one of your favorite baseball players looked right at you in the crowd and threw the ball so that you could get it. Or maybe one time you were just grocery shopping, you were going down the aisle, and coming the other way was the mayor of your city. And the mayor just simply greeted you and and took the time to, to ask you about who you are. You know, meeting a singer or an actor, an athlete, a a local leader, or even a princess on the steps of Plant Hall, for many of us, those are moments that we never, ever really forget. But friends, think about this for a moment. As amazing as it could be and is to to meet these people, can you imagine what it was like 2,000 years ago to meet Jesus? Jesus? I mean, can you imagine what it was like to to meet the God who created the heavens and the earth? The God who knit you together in your mother's womb? The God who loves you so much that he gave his life for you? Friends, can you imagine what it would have been like for Jesus to look at you? Or to hug you? Or to shake your hand? Can you imagine what it would have been like for Jesus to ask you your name or say your name out loud? Or to sit with you and eat a meal with you and talk with you? Can you imagine what it would have been like for Jesus to to ask you questions about your life? Or to listen to your concerns? Or to teach you something about yourself, something that you didn't even know? You know, we think about the amazing things that Jesus did. We often think about the healings and the miracles and the teachings. But friends, the fact that God himself the most important and prominent being in the entire universe, time and time again, stopped what he was doing, stopped where he was going, and took the time to interact with ordinary people like you and me? Friends, how amazing is that? You know, one of my favorite songs from Casting Crown so beautifully captures this idea. Take a look at how the song begins. It says, who am I? Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt. Friends, 2,000 years ago, as people were interacting and meeting Jesus, you can imagine that they were asking some of these very same questions. Who am I that Jesus, the Messiah, the, the Savior of the world, would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt? Who am I? 
You see, this morning we are beginning a new message series that we're calling Prodigal Grace. And each week during this series, we're going to be taking a look at Jesus' parable that we often call the parable of the prodigal son. Now let me ask you this, uh, what exactly does prodigal mean? What does prodigal mean? We don't really use that in our culture today. In fact, we only really use it in referencing this specific parable. And so sometimes we assume that the prodigal means the, the lost son or the younger son, right? But take a look at this. Take a look at what prodigal means. Prodigal means recklessly extravagant or having spent everything. And friends, this makes sense, right? Because the younger brother, remember, he was given the entire inheritance, his portion, and he went out, and what did he do? He was recklessly extravagant, and he ended up spending everything. But see, the reason why we're calling this series Prodigal Grace is because the term prodigal not only refers to the actions of the younger son, but it also refers to the kind of grace that Jesus was about to show to the entire world, not just to the younger brother but also to the older brother. And friends, this leads us to our question that we're going to look at today, which is this. Why did Jesus even tell this parable in the first place? In other words, what were the circumstances that led him to tell this story that you and I know so well today? Now, in Luke chapter 15, Jesus, he tells three different parables back to back to back. He tells the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and then he tells the parable of the prodigal son. And all of these parables, all three, are essentially making the exact same point, but the parable of the prodigal son goes into much greater detail than the other two. And so what he's trying to do here is that you have three parables, but they're all making the same point. The question that we're going to be looking at is, what prompted Jesus to specifically give three different parables all addressing the same point? Okay, take a look at our text for today. This is Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus told them this parable. Now, by the time we get to Luke chapter 15, Jesus had become a very popular person. So popular, in fact, right, that people were coming from all over just to meet him. And at this point... What they were surprised upon meeting him was, unlike the other prominent and important people of his day, Jesus was extremely accessible. For example, when Jesus would come into a town, he wouldn't roll up in a limo right outside the fanciest temple and get his his, his disciples to be his bodyguards and rush him up the stairs as the paparazzi's taking pictures and asking him questions. He wouldn't get up onto the stage in the temple, give a big speech, and then after he was done, Peter and John and the other disciples would whisk him out the back and get him to his limo so that they could get to his bachelor pad in Beverly Hills. Friends, Jesus had become important and prominent, but he didn't do those things. He wasn't selling tickets. He wasn't handing out VIP passes. He wasn't doing any of those things that you would expect. He was extremely accessible to people. And you know what? Not only accessible... But he was also available. Remember earlier I asked you to think back to the, the, the people that you've met, the actors, the, the singers, the athletes, the local leaders. Chances are that you only got a few minutes or even a few seconds to meet with them. For example, Abigail, the, the princess she met, it was very accessible. But because of what was happening that day, she really wasn't all that available. She only had a few minutes that she could spare. You see, throughout Jesus' ministry, it was commonplace for him to spend an entire afternoon or an entire evening sitting around a table with people, strangers, and just eating with them and talking with them. I mean, friends, can you imagine for a moment what it would be like to sit at a table with Jesus? Like, can you imagine sitting outside at O'Maddy's with with Jesus and, and a couple of your friends and You order some appetizers, you get the buffalo shrimp or the chicken tenders, and you sit there for hours and hours looking out at the gulf, just enjoying time, and Jesus is sharing about his life, and you're sharing about your life, and it's like he has all the time in the world. You see, what made Jesus different than the other important and prominent people of his day was that he was extremely accessible, but he was also extremely available. You know what, let's not stop there. Notice who Jesus was accessible and available to. It wasn't the elites. It wasn't the media. It wasn't the bigwigs of his day. Who does Luke say that Jesus was meeting with? 
tax collectors and and sinners. Now, friends, I don't know about you, but I don't wake up in the morning thinking, hey, you know what? I'd really like to get lunch with the IRS today. (laughs) Well, friends, Jesus did that all the time, right? And these tax collectors back then, man, they were way worse than the IRS today because not only did they collect taxes for Rome, but remember, they would take some extra off the top. They would make you pay more than what you needed so that they could fill their own pockets. I mean, these were dishonest people. Tax collectors were not the kind of people that you wanted to associate yourself with. And so you had these tax collectors, then you had the sinners, right? Now, it's important to note here that Luke himself is not saying that these people are sinners. Rather, he's using the term that the religious leaders used about these people back then. And the reason the religious leaders would call them sinners was because they wanted other people to make sure that they knew that they themselves were not sinners, Hey, I, I, I study God's word. <laughs> I go to the temple. I give to the temple. I worship at the temple. I stand on the street corners and pray. I mean, come on. You want to talk about sinners? That's them. That's not me. They're the sinners. But friends, as Luke is writing this, he knows the truth. He knows that the quote-unquote sinners are not the only sinners, but rather it's also the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Even Luke himself, all of them and all of us are sinners. That's why Jesus came, right? To save all of us from our sin. And so here is Jesus. He's meeting and eating with tax collectors and sinners. And who walks up onto the scene? The religious leaders specifically the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and friends, they cannot believe what they are seeing. Guys, do you see this? This man, Jesus, he welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Have you ever seen the movie Mean Girls before? Or have you ever been inside a high school cafeteria for like a minute? (laughs) Right? You know that when you just look around... It's like magically everybody has grouped off at specific tables. You got the jocks over here and the cheerleaders over here, the blondes, the brunettes, the goths, the nerds. You got all these different people, and every day, magically, they come and sit at the exact same tables with their exact same group of people. But friends, if you've seen Mean Girls before, if you've seen a TV show or a movie that has this sort of thing, when somebody from the popular table gets up and walks over and sits at the unpopular table... All of a sudden, the cafeteria goes silent. They're in shock. They're in disbelief. And the the unpopular kids at the table, they're thinking, wow, this is so cool. I, I can't believe this person is sitting with us. I mean, how cool is that? And the popular kids, they are saying the exact same thing, but with a very different tone. Wow, I can't believe that that person is sitting with them. I mean, how awful is that? You see, friends, that's what's going on here. The tax collectors and the sinners, they're thinking, hey, I can't believe that Jesus is sitting and eating with us. I mean, how cool is that? And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they're saying, I I can't believe that Jesus is eating with them. How awful is that? And friends, let's take it a step further. Back then, when you would eat with somebody, it wasn't like, hey, is this seat open? Can I just sit here? Back then, if you ate with somebody, you were engaging in a practice called table fellowship. In other words, you were saying, if I'm eating with this person, I am therefore associating with this person. In other words, hey, if I'm going to eat with them, I accept who they are. And so the reason that the Pharisees and the the religious leaders, they're bewildered, is because not only is Jesus making himself accessible and available to tax collectors and sinners, oh man, but now he's eating with them. And because he's eating with them, he's therefore publicly associating with them. He's saying, hey, I accept who you are. And friends, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they cannot believe it. And so what does Jesus do in classic Jesus form? He looks at the tax collectors and the sinners. He looks at the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And then he tells them a parable. And friends, this helps us to answer our question for today, which is this. Why did Jesus tell this parable in the first place? And the answer is because the Pharisees and the teachers of the law could not believe that Jesus was associating himself with tax collectors and sinners. But friends, here's the thing. As you and I both know today, 
That's what Jesus' ministry was all about. In other words, the reason why God himself, the most prominent and important being in the entire universe, came into the world and died for the sins of every single person was because Jesus wanted to associate himself with every single person. In fact, Jesus tells us this himself. Take a look. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and what? I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. You see, just like he did with the tax collectors and the sinners 2,000 years ago, Jesus desires table fellowship with you and I today. He desires that 100%. In other words, regardless of what anybody else says, God wants you to know that he accepts who you are, warts and all. You know, the reason why I will always remember this day, the day that Abigail met a princess outside of Plant Hall, is because in my daughter's eyes, an important and prominent person took the time to be accessible and available to her. And friends, you know what, Elaine and I, we want our two young daughters to experience moments like that with Jesus every single day. In other words, we want them to know that the most important and prominent being in the universe is accessible and available to them. That he doesn't just want to meet them. He wants to know them. And he wants to sit with them and eat with them and be with them and walk through the hills and valleys of life with them. And that whenever they make a mistake or whenever they make a wrong turn or they go down a wrong path, that our two young daughters can have peace in knowing that Jesus will continue to be with them and that he will continue to show them his prodigal grace time and time again. You see, friends, that's my prayer for you today. I pray that you never forget that the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who knit you together in your mother's womb, the God who loves you so much that he gave his life for you, I pray that you never forget that he is accessible and available to you. And he doesn't just want to meet you. He truly wants to know you. He wants to sit with you and eat with you and be with you and go through the hills and valleys of life with you. And friends, I pray that you always remember that whenever you make a mistake or you go down a wrong path or you make a bad turn, I pray that you always remember that Jesus will continue to be with you and that he will continue to show you his prodigal grace time and time again. Who am I? Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt? Friends, may you find peace and hope and joy and always knowing that Jesus loves you, that Jesus is with you, that Jesus is accessible and available to you, and that nothing, nothing that happens in this world is ever going to change that. We can trust that today, amen? Amen.